Good morning, everyone. Today we're going to talk about moral courage and moral authority. And we're going to look at Jesus as kind of emblematic as a person who has moral authority and moral courage in spades. I'm going to ask ourselves, how come we don't, we who are the followers of Jesus? Today is uh, Sunday, September 27th, 2020. We're coming to you from the sanctuary of Ansley United Church in Markdale. And uh, we have our usual team with us. We have David and Tim. We have David at the organ. We have Jane and Mary uh, singing uh, for us again today. And uh, we're here for worship with you. Next Sunday, which is the first Sunday of October, is our Worldwide Communion Sunday. So on video, we are going to have a, a communion service next Sunday. So just start to think about that, that you'll want to have your own bread and juice or wine uh, ready for that uh, for next Sunday's service. So let's begin with our prelude. <laughs> gather in the light of Christ. The light of Christ is with us, all around us, and definitely within us. So as we worship today, may the light of Christ shine upon us and through us in our time together. To begin, a reminder from scripture in Micah chapter 6. With what should I come before the Lord and bow down before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O oh man, what is good? And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice and to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. So we're going to sing that hymn that uh, tells us those words again in music form. What does the Lord require of you? It's number 701 in our hymn book, and uh, if you'd like to sing along. <laughs>
Ah, if only it was so simple, those three things, seeking justice, loving kindness, walking humbly with our God are probably the most difficult things for most of us to do. Let's begin with prayer and our opening prayer, so please bow your heads with me. Great spirit of oneness, great source of life and love, we are gathered in your spirit, we are gathered in your love. We open our hearts and our mouths. They are filled with songs and praise. We open our minds and our spirits. They are filled with the prayers of our hearts. As we gather once again in these few moments of worship, our world still beckons us to be the change that is needed. Our community, our circles of care, our partners and our friends all beckon us to choose life, to embrace hope, and to be the love we wish to see in our world. And so, may this time together give us courage and strength for these tasks, we pray. Amen. Our hymn is Deep in Our Hearts. It's number 154 in More Voices, Deep in Our Hearts. prayers this morning, I want to invite you to uh, do a, a cupping over your heart. So it's just not like this, but more like this. So uh, 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 an open kind of cupping um, as we are praying. So let us pray. Living with an open heart to the world around us means living with an open heart. In our prayers, let us open our hearts to one another, to the community in which we sit right now, and to the world around us. Let us hear the call of those who are sick or lonely in our families, 
in our circles of care. Let us remember those in hospital. Let us remember those facing treatments. Let us remember those who are grieving. And let us be grateful that we have people in our lives who need us and want us. Let us hear the call from within our own souls, calling for purpose, for acknowledgement, for assurance. Our own inner spirits call to us to listen to who we really are. Let us be grateful for moments of awareness. Let us hear the call of those who have suffered or are in pain or trauma. Let us hear the call of those calling for reconciliation, for affirmation. Our torn up world with all its fragments seems to be calling new things from us, calling us to new directions. Let us be grateful that we are able to respond. As we gather this morning, let us be mindful of the essence of life which runs in us and through us and the freedom we have to express who we are. Here in this church, in the arts, in our jobs, with our families, let us hear the call to be a blessing to others not to shine the light on ourselves, but to spread it to those around us and to those in need. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And now let us join together in the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now one more hymn, The Church is Wherever. This hymn is in the hymn book, it's number 579, but we're singing four verses that were written by a, a Canadian fellow by the name of Paul Chappelle. And uh, you'll need those verses on the, the print copy of this service uh, to sing along. <laughs> Thank you. 
Well, it's time for our scripture lessons. The first one is from the Old Testament, uh, the book of Deuteronomy. Just reading a few short verses from uh, chapter 24. And, uh, and then the uh, Gospel of Mark, I'm reading uh, a little bit from uh, chapter 1. Um, it seems to me that if uh, Jesus uh, was a person of the highest moral character, and I certainly think he was, then it kind of makes sense for us to look at what he did. This person with such high moral character, what are the things that, that he did? And in chapter one, it's just one thing right after another. You get a real sense of, of what that means. But first, Deuteronomy. Whenever you reap your harvest in your field and have forgotten a sheaf in the field, you may not go back to get it. It will be for the foreigner or for the fatherless or for the widow so that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work in your hands. When you beat your olive tree, you may not go over the boughs again. The remainder will be for the foreigner or for the fatherless or for the widow. And when you gather the grapes of your vineyard, you shall not glean it again. It will be for the foreigner, for the fatherless, and the widow. You must remember always that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. Therefore, I command you to do this thing. And Mark chapter 1. They all went to Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, Jesus entered the synagogue and taught. They were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority, not as the scribes. And in their synagogue, there was a man with an unclean spirit. He cried out, leave us alone. What do you have to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? Oh, I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him and said, Be silent and come out of him. When the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice, it came out of him. They were all amazed so that they questioned amongst themselves, What is this? What new teaching is this? With authority he commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. So his fame spread everywhere throughout the region of Galilee. A leper came to him, pleading with him and kneeling before him, saying, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus, moved with compassion, extended his hand and touched him, and said to him, I will be clean. As soon as he had spoken, the leprosy immediately departed from him, and the man was cleansed. But Jesus sternly warned him, sent him away at once. He said, see that you say nothing to anyone. Go your way, show yourself to the priest, and offer yourself for cleansing, as Moses commanded. But instead, the leper went out and began to proclaim widely and to spread the news around so that Jesus could no more openly enter the city, but had to stay out in the remote places. And they came to him from every quarter. Here ends our scriptures for today. There was a man named Michael who was a constant presence in the eight years that I was minister at Leaside United in Toronto. I first met Mike after a car accident had shredded his legs and he had to be in the hospital for many months, 19 operations on his legs and back, which left him in permanent pain and addicted to pain medications. Later on, he had surgery on one eye. The surgery was botched at first, and he ended up blind in that eye. Uh, soon after that, his wife got cancer and died, and then uh, his daughter was taken from him and given to another family member. His life was a train wreck. He was a complicated, 
a difficult figure, and he was always on my doorstep wanting something from me, needing something from me. Michael, however, was kind. He had a huge heart. His only desire was to figure out new ways to help us out at the church. But when he finally became confined to a wheelchair, his days of moving furniture and such for us were were over. You would think that all the suffering and pain of this uh, man's life would affect his character, might make him bitter or angry or cynical, but it didn't. His soul just kept shining out of him. In fact, the more things happened to him, the more his soul just kept shining out of him. Here's a story. One day, Uh, He actually embodied the Good Samaritan story. He'd been learning to use his new wheelchair. He was ambling up and down all the many driveways along uh, one of the streets in Leaside. And when all of a sudden, just like that, a wheel got caught, it flipped him in his wheelchair upside down, the wheelchair on top of him, so that his face was smashed against the concrete of the sidewalk. And Being so disabled, he was completely unable to move. A man came by. He asked Mike if he needed help. Kind of obvious. Mike said, no, I'm fine. Have a good day. Another man hurried by and stopped and looked at Mike and then hurried away again. Two girls came by and, and laughed at him. One took his picture on her phone. But in every case, Mike just wished these people well and encouraged them to have a great day. Here was a man who had borne more than his share of pain and suffering, yet who sought to change the world around him if he could. I think of uh, Mother Teresa as one of the great ones of moral character. In the caverns of her heart and soul, however, she bore a lot of intense suffering and pain, as her diaries would reveal uh, long after her death. In fact, Mother Teresa, whom we all think of as this saintly woman helping the poor of Calcutta, was consumed by her own unworthiness, the feeling that she really was good for nothing, the feeling of experiencing that dark night of the soul. Yet, as you know, she was famous for her care and compassion. She was relentless in her pursuit of justice for the poor. She was masterful at eliciting huge financial donations for her charity from the richest tycoons of the world. But if I was looking for someone with moral courage, I would look to her. But I've often thought that only the great ones are so good. You know, the Mother Teresa's, the uh, Nelson Mandela's, the, the Gandhi's of the world, because they stand out as maybe the most morally or ethically sound. But what the Bible encourages us to do is for us to find our own moral character and to live good ethical lives ourselves, not to look for that from somebody else, but to almost like a muscle in our body, to exercise that muscle of moral character in our body. Oh, I realize very well that uh, this talk of morals is very last century. I mean, no one these days in their right mind would try to articulate a moral position for heaven's sakes. Cancel culture would just stomp all over them. And it seems that in a world that is open and wide in terms of its philosophical and spiritual spectrums, a world of dizzying choice for our young people especially, a world where right and wrong is relativized, 
it would seem that there would still be space for morals to enter into the commons, to be a part of the mix, but that doesn't seem to be the case. Long the purview of the church, and when I talk about the church, I mean the church with a capital C, morality was often very strictly defined and unfortunately relegated to the two areas of uh, greed and lust, uh, money and sexuality. The church used its moral positions over the centuries to exert power and influence in people's lives with the added threat that if you didn't behave in a certain way or follow certain rules, then uh, you weren't going to the good place when you died, let's put it that way. But as we all know, in the 20th century, the Wizard of Oz was revealed as a humbug and the churches lost their moral high ground as scandal after scandal eroded trust in not only in their power, but in their morality. And you know how it is. Once it's been decided that someone has offended our morals, then they become almost a pariah. The irony is that we, in our moral certainty, feel it is moral to judge. How twisted is that? In the Hebrew scriptures, in the book of Deuteronomy, morality is articulated really clearly. And there are verses and verses and chapters and chapters of what it is to do the right thing or the good thing. And to me, morality isn't hinged on the seven deadly sins or anything like that. Morality is simply finding a way to get to the good and the right. In chapter 24 of Deuteronomy, we find the writer discussing all sorts of things, the ethics of loaning money to people or the ethics of collecting debts from people who owe you money. We read how you must honor the poor or needy. And through it all, there's this repetitive refrain that uh, we must honor the fatherless, the orphans, the widow, and the foreigner. That little refrain of those three uh, needy groups must be kept first and foremost in the actions of a good Jew. If we were to take Deuteronomy seriously and to perhaps find ways to update some of the principles there and place them within our context, we would probably find some thoroughly challenging and interesting things. But mainly, I think, we'd be forced to admit that we live in a culture with a very thin layer of moral grounding and perhaps even with a generalized lack of concern for those without power, especially the poor, especially those of color, especially those of black skin color, and very little concern for those who are lonely or marginalized, the widows for sure, but also the widowers who, in my experience, are largely left to fend to themselves. And I've said before in this very place how egregious it has been during this COVID time to, conf to, to confine our frail elderly to care facilities and then for their own good, the good of their health, to deny them access to all the people who, who could um, shower them with love and care. Our culture exemplifies those who did not respond well to my friend Michael's predicament with the wheelchair. Whole segments of our culture have fallen on the ground and lay trapped there by systems or by a culture of marginalization, while we in the dominant culture, and that includes the Christian culture, look on but don't act. We may not even stop to think how we might help. One of the men who passed Michael by that day, because there were quite a few in this long litany that uh, he related to me later that day, one of the men who passed Michael by told him that unfortunately he was late for a meeting 
and that his time was worth a lot of money. So that if he stopped and took the time to call the ambulance and get help for Mike, he would have to charge Michael $200 for his time. So I'm not making this kind of stuff up. It's the absolute truth. Yet this very same logic tells black people that they must bear the suffering of an immoral system. While others make money, they are crushed on sidewalks. Indeed, black parents still warn their children, even in our safe country, uh, black parents still warn their children of the dangers of going out without proper identification. In some places in the States, they could die for that. So yes, I do wonder about the decay of moral discourse and the absence of moral courage in our times because after COVID, what I've been hearing is that we're going to have to reconstruct our society because what COVID has done is it has shown us the deep cracks in our society. So how, it makes sense to me, how can we reconstruct our society if we are not doing that based on principles that are good and right? In other words, with some moral uh, authority. Morality, when not about sex or money, as I said already, it is about good and right principles. It's just that something which sounds so simple most certainly isn't because, again, then it goes to who decides what is good and right, who decides who is in and out, who decides who is deserving of help and who is not, who decides who is worthy. Is our colonialist system of oppression appropriate anymore in this day? Well, that's a lot to think about on a fall Sunday morning. And I kind of hesitate to bring it up in a way because nobody wants to hear about morality, except that on our country's agenda these days is the social reorganization of our country. So we, as Christians, whether we've lost our moral courage or not, well, let's admit one thing. One is we've forgotten that we have the power of the Spirit of Christ in our bodies and in our minds because we've kind of given up on who Jesus is and the, the power of the Christ in us. But Jesus is our model. He's the prototype of one who with a well-developed moral and ethical character, just time after time after time, does the good and right thing. And it doesn't matter whether we're Christian or not Christian, that part of it doesn't matter. He is the par excellence model of moral character. And so here we have our founder, the one that kind of gives us our life as someone we have kind of forgotten to emulate. How can that be? Is it that we've forgotten about the power that we have or the, this recreative, creative energy that I keep talking about that, that's kind of born in us each day? Or have we forgotten about the, the power of the resurrection? Not the power of his resurrection back in time, but the power of our resurrection that happens when we live inside the spirit of Christ and gives us courage and power to act and to be the people that we're called to be in this world. Have we forgotten? You see, the gospel of Jesus, it forces us to get out into the real world and it asks us to look at the way, at the world the way Jesus might do and to figure out what principles we might need to go by in addressing the problems of the world. That is, by definition, a moral exercise. 
All we need to do is to speak words of truth and care, compassion and hope into the great moral vacuum around us and the very real body of Christ will come back to life as we do so. If you have it in front of you, your Bible, Mark chapter 1, these first few, verse, few verses of Mark, I mean, so we, we look at this and we see this person, this uh, person of high moral, moral character, and we can call him Jesus, or we can call him the soul of the world, or we can call him love embodied. And so we see the soul of the world come alive into a world that needs it. And we see the embodiment of love walking around in the world at a time it was needed. Embodying the the principles of concern for the poor and the powerless, the downtrodden, the marginalized, the hated, and the reviled. Because that's what we find in chapter one. This person deals with the most marginalized and reviled parts of his society as if it's almost like job one, right? It is top level stuff that he's doing. In just a few verses, we see him healing a man with demons. Then he goes to Peter's mother-in-law and heals her from, from her fever. Pretty soon, the soul of the world, the embodiment of love in the world, is healing everyone. They're all coming to his door. He's driving out demons. He's restoring life. He's dealing firsthand with the people on the lowest rungs of the socioeconomic ladder. Next, a man with leprosy, who's the most reviled and detested of all, becomes the recipient of Jesus' compassion. Friends. The only response to this is, wow, wow. This is what is right and good. The principle on which our best actions can be based. Care, compassion for those on the lowest rungs of society. Andrew Harvey says that our time now in this moment of history is the time of sacred activism. Sacred sacred activism, he said, must claim the moral agenda and must offer hope and healing and restoration and reconciliation wherever it is needed. And he also goes on to say that all the resources of the world need now to be turned to the lowest of the low. So look, when churches run out of ideas, when we lose our way, when we say we can't do it anymore, when we get to the point when we're bored with ourselves or with our worship or our words, then that's a clear sign that we've lost our moral courage. And that's also a clear sign for the resurrection of Jesus Christ because he will boot us in the booty and kick us out of here and back into the streets. Because if the most marginalized people in our society are the litmus test for how well our society is doing, then it is clear that we must adequately address such things as the lack of housing, clean water, access to health care. I'm thinking particularly of our indigenous reserves. Our government should fix those first before doing anything else. And it's clear that those without jobs or meaningful employment or who for whatever reason are unemployable must be given a dignified living out of our tax dollars. I'd pay more tax if that's what it took. And it's clear to me that access to child care, language training, in-home health care, and a whole host of other social services must be given to those in marginalized groups. Because I think what we really want to do, if we're going to reimagine this society in which we live and create a culture that is true to our principles, 
that we want to create a society of care, a culture of compassion. We want to create a culture that is based on justice, kindness, and humility. I submit we, as Christians, want to have something to say about this, it's going to take moral courage to do so. May it be so. Well, our last hymn today is in Voices United hymn book. It is number 567, Will You Come and Follow Me? 567. Well, friends, let us go into the world with courage. Let us go into the world with love. Let us go into the world with strength and purpose. And let us go into the world to create the kind of world that we all want to live in. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us. Amen. And now our postlude with David Fries.